Okay, welcome back. Um, we still have people kind of filtering in, but I think we'll get started with the afternoon session. So uh, the afternoon session turns this over to the surgeons, and uh, we talked a lot about metastatic disease and, and systemic therapy, but now um, uh, Dr. Angie Smith is a urologist at the University of North Carolina and may actually talk about not surgery. <laughs> um, what I asked her to talk about was one of the questions that we got in the, in the morning was, how do you decide when you should do surgery or when you should just watch? And um, it's a very topical and um, highly debated question in our tumor boards. And um, I think we'll hear you know, how some of these decisions get made. So, Angie. Well, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Um, so really it's about the small renal mass and I, uh, I, I'm gonna just start out by just defining what I mean by that because uh, a lot of people talk about the small renal mass but what does that really mean? And then talk a little bit about the management strategies that we can apply to it, uh, mainly surveillance versus surgery and then talk a little bit about decision making as she said. So I, I figured we'd start with a case presentation to sort of put um, a patient to the sort of the whole decision-making process. So this is a patient I had, 60-year-old male, who presented to the ER, and he had some lower back pain. And this is actually a really common scenario we find. He came with another problem, and then the ER obtained a CT scan. Even though his problem was actually lower back pain, it was just some muscle strain. He was ultimately diagnosed also with this small renal mass, which was discovered, which is 1.6 centimeters. And, and so this is, this is often how these present. And so the question is, what's his diagnosis and what are his options? And I'm going to use um, this case to kind of circle back at the end to talk a little bit about putting this in perspective. So to start, what is a small renal mass? Well, it's defined as a renal tumor less than four centimeters. And, you know, in the United States, I think it's hard to understand what a centimeter is, even myself. And so I put a roller up here just to put it in perspective. So forgive me if that's too, too, too simple. But for me, I just think of it, it's like a little over an inch and a half for a four centimeter tumor. And then, um, and sometimes it's defined as less than six centimeters, depending on where you read. But, but generally, it's four centimeters. It's asymptomatic, meaning there really are no symptoms that go along with it, um, generally speaking. It's confined to the kidney, so it hasn't spread. And then in terms of imaging um, qualities, we look at um, whether it's solid appearing, and then we, we, we call it enhancing with IV contrast. What that means is it's bright with IV contrast. And so those are the things we're looking for, and that was the characteristic of this gentleman's tumor. So a little background about small renal masses. Well, over time, the number of small renal tumors has increased. And as you can see from 1997 to 2006, there's been this in, um, increase. And that's due in part because we're imaging more in the ER. We, we do CTs and MRIs on many people. And I bet number, if not almost all of us here, has had some kind of imaging for something. And so we call that an incidental finding whenever we find something that's not really related to why you got the imaging in the first place. And, um, and you can see this actually separates out the graph based on stage. And, and these small renal masses are, are by definition stage one. Um, and you can see that top line um, going up. Let's see. And this top line is, is on the incline. And that, and that really is... is um, uh, responsible for that that increase in 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 renal masses, and so uh, what we know is that in the 1970s, is really only 10 percent um, that were find or were, that were found on CT or MRI imaging, and now it's almost half of patients with low stage are found this way. And the the issue is the greatest incidence actually in older folks and um, over 70. And in the autopsy series where they actually looked at patients after they died for other, um, other causes before widespread imaging was in play, nearly three quarters of the, um, of the renal cell masses were clinically, in a, uh, were clinically in apparent, meaning that um, the majority of them, that wasn't the cause of death. And so that supports the thought that maybe these renal cancers grow slowly. And so that represents a dilemma for us because um, if we're having these small renal masses and there are older patients and perhaps these patients, um, the risk for surgery or treatment is, is a little bit higher in, in these patients. So can we safely observe some of these tumors? And then if so, what are the characteristics that define the tumors that can be observed um, and potentially undergo delayed uh, intervention or no intervention at all? 
And then finally, what criteria, whoops, what criteria might guide our decision between treatment and observation? So this is just a, a schematic. These are generally the three categories of, of management options for small renal masses. So first is active surveillance, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, it's also known as uh, watchful waiting, if you've heard of that term. The second is ablative therapy. I'm not gonna really talk about that today, but that's cryotherapy and radiofrequency ablation. What that means is cryotherapy is freezing the tumor, and then radiofrequency ablation is putting a, a probe in the tumor and basically heating it to destroy the tissue. And these are newer therapies, so the longer term um, outcomes are a little less known. So I'm not gonna talk about that so much today. Um, the third uh, option is surgery, and that's partial or radical nephrectomy, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I have a little uh, X over radical nephrectomy, not to say that that's not an appropriate therapy for some people with small renal masses, but generally speaking, that's pretty aggressive, so we try to steer away from that if we can, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So starting with active surveillance, what is it? Well, this is an approach that involves really no intervention at all other than the close follow-up of the patient, uh, mainly with clinic visits, history and physical exam, um, laboratory studies, and imaging, whether it be CT, MRI, and in some cases, ultrasound for some patients. And despite the earlier detection of these renal masses, there's, been, there's not been a clear improvement in cancer-specific survival. So that suggests to us that maybe treatment of some of these tumors may not be necessary. And we know that up to 20 to 30% of these very small renal masses actually will be benign. So we don't want to over-treat um, when we don't need to be. So what's the issue here? Well, the problem is that um, not all re renal tumors behave the same, and it's really difficult to tell which one is going to have malignant potential and which, one are ben which ones are benign. We do have biopsies um, to aid our um, to aid our, di uh, our decision-making process, but a negative biopsy doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's not a renal cell carcinoma. Also, CT MRI and imaging can actually understage renal cell carcinoma. So who is active surveillance for? Well, it's reserved mainly for patients who have a limited life expectancy due to other competing medical conditions, um, and patients where surgery is not an option, and intervention where the intervention has a significant chance of decreasing quality of life. Now, that's not to say that's, that's all it's for. I mean, there are younger patients that are very appropriate for this, and, and really what I, what I really stress to my patients is this is a shared decision. It's not just the surgeon who's making this decision. It's very important that the patient weighs in as well, so it's really a shared decision-making process. So this is just a general scheme, but certainly there are many other patients who this would be appropriate for as well. So how do we decide when to treat or if to treat? Well, we don't have a lot. We have biopsy, and that can be helpful. Um, but there's also the growth rate, and I think that's really the mainstay of how we decide um, what we do. So there is a study that looked at over 200 patients who had an average follow-up of two and a half years, and they took a look at the growth rate. The average growth rate overall was about 0.28 centimeters per year, which is small, um, and that was smaller than the average growth rate for RCC-proven masses, which is 0.4 centimeters per year. And so we, we generally like to think that um, if there is an uh, increased growth rate, that's going to um, sort of push us toward an actual intervention. The other thing that was helpful to know in the study is that only three of those uh, 234 patients had metastatic disease, and, of, and all three ended up having some kind of growth. So there were no reports of metastatic disease without some renal mass growth, and that's actually um, comforting to know since we use that as part of our, uh, our decision-making process. This, but does no growth mean no cancer? And the answer is unfortunately no. Um, this is a smaller study looking at two groups. Uh, one group had no growth, one had growth, and you can see that the renal cell carcinoma on pathology in that last row is not that different. Um, so it's, we really don't have um, a perfect method, but we do use growth rate um, to, to sort of guide uh, what we do know in, in biopsy as well. So what's the follow-up schedule if you're placed on active surveillance? So the first thing I'll say is that compliance is mandatory. So you, again, you want to have a patient who's going to come back because it's important to, to keep monitoring this. So if I have a patient who I don't, don't think or, or is going to be very difficult for them to come back to see me, I may not um, recommend active surveillance for that patient. Um, again, uh, percutaneous biopsy can be considered, and in the American Urological Association guidelines, um, they mention the role of biopsy in that, in that way, and they also recommend that 
there is a, a, a CT or an MRI of, uh, or imaging of some sort at six months and then annually thereafter. And that's pretty um, uh, conservative. We, we actually do a little bit more of an aggressive surveillance regimen at UNC. So in the first year, we'll uh, image every three to four months. And the reason we do that is because you really want to have a growth trajectory. You want to have two points on that line so you can see you're here or you're here. And that kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're going with the um, surveillance. And then if there's stable size um, in that first year, we'll move that out to every six months and then, and then beyond that to annually. And then if there was a biopsy proven renal cell, and so we know that we're following renal cell carcinoma versus just a small renal mass, then uh, it's recommended to get an annual chest x-ray just to look if there's any spread of disease. Um, and then I have this last question, what's the trigger to treat? And I, it's intentionally there's no answer there because there really is no um, gold standard on exactly when to treat. But I think that it's, again, a shared decision between the patient and the, and the surgeon. And I also think that it, it really comes down to growth rate um, and then a lot, of, a lot about what the patient, um, what the risks are for the patient for treatment, how sick they are, and, and so forth. So that moves into surgery, so when we do treat. And um, I just, I know many of you know this, if not all, but I'm gonna just say this one more time and kind of, kind of go through what a radical nephrectomy is and what a partial nephrectomy is for those who, who are not aware. So radical nephrectomy is removing the entire kidney, and a partial nephrectomy is just removing the kidney mass, leaving the rest of the kidney, the normal kidney, behind. So this is just a, a schematic, but it's, it's pretty simple. There are three main steps. The first step is to find the renal artery and vein. And then we use um, either a stapler or, um, or some kind of clips or um, just suture to divide the blood vessels. And then the second step is to divide the ureter, the, basically the tube that runs from the kidney down to the bladder. And then finally, removing the remaining attachments of the kidney, and the entire kidney is removed. For a partial nephrectomy, like I said, it was just, it's just removing the actual kidney tumor. And so it's similar steps, but obviously um, a little bit different here, because instead of uh, dividing the renal vessels, here we, we identify and then we put clips on them, or, or bulldogs that are actually going to be removed at the end of the case. So we clip it to, re to make sure the blood supply is not such that we're going to have a lot of bleeding when we cut the tumor out. And that's the second step, is, is removing that tumor and just kind of cutting out that area, and then finally sewing that defect together, and then removing the clips at the end. So I just want to talk a little bit about the rationale for partial nephrectomy. You remember at the beginning I had that like X around radical nephrectomy again. Radical nephrectomy can be appropriate in many um, scenarios, but partial nephrectomy, the rationale for, um, for doing partial nephrectomy over a radical um, stems from a couple different things. So this, the, first, um, the first study that I want to talk about is just the fact that they looked at chronic kidney disease, so renal function that's diminished, and that was an independent risk factor for death, cardiovascular events like heart attack, stroke, and then hospitalization as well. And so they did another study that looked at patients' survival for those who had small renal masses in both radical and partial nephrectomy. And the top line here um, is partial nephrectomy, and they had better survival than those with radical nephrectomy. And the basis for that may um, result from a greater decrease in the renal function after radical nephrectomy. And all of this is up for debate, but this is the, the, at least what we think about why we um, push partial nephrectomy over radical nephrectomy. There's also been shown to be an improved quality of life after partial. There's been shown to be equivalent cancer-free survival in patients who had partial versus radical for these small renal masses. And then I just want to remind you, up to 30% of these renal masses under 4 centimeters are benign. So again, we may be taking out a whole kidney for a benign lesion. So despite all of these um, factors that I mentioned, uh, it's still fairly uh, underutilized for renal masses that are small. And you can see this, um, this uh, chart. So the black line, the black bars here are radical nephrectomy, and these um, lightly shaded bars are partial. You can see that um, that's been increasing from the late 1980s up to the early 2000s. It continues to increase um, currently. Um, but the potential reasons for that underutilization is that there's a belief that maybe patients aren't really at risk for chronic kidney disease if they already have a normal normal kidney function or if they have a normal kidney on the other side. 
Um, there's also a question of lack of comfort of the surgeon in performing um, the partial nephrectomy because there was uh, previously there was a lot of people who were very comfortable with the radical nephrectomy doing, using I'm sorry using small incisions for that, and doing it with um, doing that for a partial nephrectomy was more technically challenging, but now um, there's more use of the robot and I'll talk about that just in a moment, um, and that has allowed a lot of surgeons who perhaps couldn't do that with pure laparoscopy to do it with a different type of technology and still have good outcomes and still have small incisions for the patients. Um, and so as I mentioned, um, the robotic partial wasn't um, really described until 2004, and now we're seeing much more utilization of that uh, since 2008, and I think that's going to just continue to increase. So just a little word about what the robot is, and I, I say this because this is a really common question I get from patients in the clinic because they think that the, an actual robot is doing the surgery, and that's not the case. So it's actually the surgeon who is, um, who is really at this console that's away from the patient that's making the robot move. So it really isn't automated in any way. There's a surgeon involved. In fact, there are two surgeons involved, um, the surgeon who's at the console and then an assistant surgeon who's next to the patient sort of in this background over here. And this person and actually puts the instruments in all these arms and also assists the, the console surgeon. And it's important to remember that the surgeon's hands are placed in these special devices, so their actual fingers are, are actually making um, all the movements themselves and, um, and, and performing the procedure. And this is what it looks like on the patient's um, belly. So uh, just a few small incisions, whereas it used to be for an uh, open procedure, if it, was, it would be a very large incision. And, um, they, would, they would have um, uh, a longer stay in the hospital, uh, it would be a longer recovery time. So this has um, made a big impact for a lot of the patients with small renal masses who require treatment. So these are just a couple pictures from um, the OR just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. So this is just norm normal kidney is going to be flat, um, but these small renal masses will show up as just sort of little um, mound, and you can usually tell, and if you can't, we can actually put an ultrasound in to identify the tumor. So we identify it, and like I said, we, we have already identified our renal vessels, our artery and vein, and we're going to put a clamp on it so that we reduce flow just temporarily so we don't get a lot of blood loss. And then we take scissors um, and we cut around the tumor. It almost looks like an acorn once you remove it because you're, it's almost like a, a little cone that you're um, cutting out right here. So this is the base of the tumor and they're cutting down and he's gonna cut all the way around this tumor and then remove it. Once you're done, you get this divot um, right here in the kidney. So this is all healthy kidney. And, um, and once you have that, you're going to take um, really just a fancy uh, needle and thread to sew it back together and that rem that's the uh, final part of the procedure. So at UNC, you can even see this um, takeoff of partial nephrectomy. This is for um, tumors that were less than seven centimeters. So these are small renal tumors, some, but some of them are, are larger, and you can see that over the years, um, these partials are really overtaking um, radical nephrectomy, which is in the light blue. And then it's even more dramatic when you look at these true small renal masses that are less than four centimeters, and you can see this kind of dramatic uptick in partial nephrectomy. So how does the follow-up schedule differ from active surveillance? And that's something to think about in terms of how often you want to be seen. And um, the um, AUA guidelines, again, they recommend, um, even though this is, again, there's not a lot of evidence that's behind all of this, this is sort of just expert guidelines, they recommend a baseline imaging within three to 12 months after surgery. And that's just to take a look at how things look, um, sort of at the baseline, so you have something to compare um, in the future if anything um, is worrisome. If you underwent a radical nephrectomy, uh, additional imaging is actually optional in, in these small renal masses. And so you could potentially be done with imaging, um, at least from the kidney standpoint, um, at that point. If you had a partial nephrectomy, the additional imaging um, is recommended annually every year for about three years. And, it, and you know, in some cases, you may want to extend that. And then for all patients, a yearly chest x-ray for three years to evaluate for any spread of disease um, based on the AUA guidelines. And again, this comes from the AUA as well. This is a, um, their decision-making algorithm. I kind of, um, it's a little more complicated than this, but I think this is really the, um, the gist of what they're getting at. And they, they categorize patients into four categories. So we have healthy patients here and here, and we have sick patients. 
and we all have very small masses, which are the masses less than four centimeters, and then small masses, which are the, this um, four to six centimeter category. And you can see that really the gold standard, yes, is surgery. And, and, and when I say surgery, partial nephrectomy is, is truly gold standard, but radical nephrectomy in some cases, especially if the tumor is in a location where a partial nephrectomy is not, um, is not able to be, to, to be performed. Um, but you can see that it's also recommended uh, when patients are sick. Um, so you can see it here, either surveillance or surgery, because this is a large, slightly larger mass, surveillance or ablation, which I didn't talk about today, but cryo or radiofrequency ablation for the very small mass in a sick patient. So, but it's still an option, and that's what I, I was mentioning. It's still an option for anybody um, with these uh, very small or small renal masses, and that's something to consider. And again, it's about the decision-making process between the patient and the surgeon. So I want to circle back to that first case presentation and sort of put it in perspective, because uh, this patient sort of did both. And um, so it's a 60-year-old male, again, with the 1.6 centimeter renal mass. And he opted for active surveillance, which I think was appropriate. He actually had some comorbidities. He had had a stroke. Um, and he had some other uh, medical issues. So I think active surveillance was very appropriate for him. Um, and so we decided to do imaging every three months just to start um, to kind of get that trajectory and to understand the growth rate of the kidney tumor. And so what we found was that it was a stable size at the three month, but at six month we found a, a jump in the size. And you can see there's that first um, image. And then here it looks uh, what it looks like at six months. And the whole point is to capture this before it becomes something bigger, um, but yet not over treat those who really didn't require treatment to begin with. So we made the decision together to go ahead and um, pursue robotic partial nephrectomy. And so that was performed, and the path confirmed a renal cell carcinoma. It still was um, staged 1, uh, T1A, because it was very small. And we, um, for the guidelines, obtained a follow-up scan about three months later. And you can actually see a little bit where the defect was, no tumor anymore. Um, but that's generally the appearance that we find after, uh, for the baseline follow-up scan. So what we're going to do with him is annual imaging for three years because we did a partial nephrectomy, and that'll include not just a CT, but also a chest x-ray. And so far, he's been doing very well. So just my summary slide, I want to just, um, these are the key points here. I think small renal masses are being detected with increasing frequency. We're going to see more and more of these as time goes on and as we do more and more imaging in the ER. Um, there's no reliable way yet to know which tumors are going to behave aggressively. Uh, and so active surveillance and some ablative therapies like cryo and radiofrequency ablation are options for the carefully selected patient or the high-risk surgical patient. Um, but partial nephrectomy still is the gold standard, and we have to remember that when we're um, counseling the pa our patients. Um, now with this, uh, the advent of the robotic um, partial nephrectomy, it's become easier on the patient to have this surgery, and that's an important point. Um, I'm not saying that it's an easy procedure to go through, but it certainly um, it can be easier than the open partial, and that, um, that's saying something right there. Uh, but I think that um, our hope is that improvements in both biopsy techniques and imaging techniques um, and even just molecularly characterizing the tumor itself will help us to better um, characterize not just, um, just in general these tumors, but really individualize it for each patient. And that's really the hope. Once we have that, it'll be even easier to figure out who would be best served with active surveillance. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Another surgical talk. Um, I think the nephrectomy is something that um, this crowd is very familiar with, but um, specifically um, after nephrectomy, uh, this is uh, Dr. Rampersad, who's one of our colleagues at Duke Hospital. Thanks for having me. Is there anybody in the room that
hasn't had surgery yet? Anybody that's had surgery that's needing another surgery? I'm not selling myself. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, simply, um, I'm simply asking because I think a lot about recovery after surgery has to do with what you were expecting before surgery uh, and the conversations that you had and, and learning about what it is that you have before surgery. I mean, the way this ends up happening is um, oftentimes the patient will find out that they have a tumor and they'll, they'll show up and they will have done their uh, due diligence and reading a whole bunch of stuff before they get to you and, and in their mind they have it, what I need. And, and really what has to happen is you need to look at the patient, look at the tumor, and figure out what's going to hurt you worse. Is the surgery going to hurt you worse? Or is the treatment going to hurt you worse than the tumor? And that's kind of what Dr. Smith was talking about before. Sometimes you don't need treatment right away. Um, sometimes you don't need treatment at all. And sometimes, obviously, you do. And, uh, and that kind of is where we lead into recovery. Expectations of recovery. Recovery is multifactorial. They're the tumor factors that help dictate the surgery you have or maybe don't need. And then the U factors, which are um, described by your functional status, your mobility, your general health, your nutritional status, um, motivation and expectations, uh, realizing that maybe the most important factors about recovering from the surgery don't have to do really with the surgery itself. Maybe they have to do with uh, getting up and about and realizing that healing is more about moving and healing rather than sitting still and healing. And also the emotional readiness for what it is that you have and what it is that you're getting ready to go through. Because largely, uh, this is hitting people like a brick wall. It causes me uh, to, uh, to examine my own life and, and realize that uh, I can't simply plan for when I'm 65. I, I tell my parents now, save your money, but don't save all of it. Because uh, you, a lot of times you're just not ready to hear that this is what, what's happened. And, uh, and it, it's a process of learning about the disease, um, meeting other people that have it, meeting other people that have had successes, and understanding what the future holds. Well, that color didn't come up. <coughs> this is a Mac to PC. Uh, process, but really what this was pointing to, well, the, that, that was worse. Um, these were tumor factors, so location of the tumor, the size of the tumor, whether it's localized or metastatic, those factors are going to help determine what it is that one would need, um, if anything at all, and how extensive that treatment is going to be from the very beginning in, in terms of evaluation on through uh, months and years later. There's the surgery factors. Is it going to be an open operation? Are we going to, is it so big and, and in, in encompassing the big blood vessels of your body that we have to put you on cardiopulmonary bypass? We're going to do it laparoscopically, robotically, and the complications that are associated with it. And what I tell patients about this is I liken it to a hobby of mine, which is driving cars. I've driven a, 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 a ra little race car um, for over 10 years now at this racetrack up, up in Virginia called Virginia International Raceway. And most of the weekends that I go up there, there are a lot of hobbyists like myself that are there just for the weekend. We have other jobs. And, uh, and we just like to get the speed out of us on a racetrack in a con pseudo controlled situation. And then there are other folks that are there that are training to be race car drivers. And they're people that actually are racers, and they end up being teachers at these camps that we go to. And it's pretty easy to realize, uh, it, it, you realize early on that you could take the true racers and put them in cars that are half the car that your car is, and they'll beat you around a track. It doesn't so much have to do with the car. At some point it does, but it doesn't so much have to do with the car as much as it does the driver. And really what you need to do is you need to find persons with whom you develop 
good relationships and that you um, feel confident with and, and, uh, and you move forward with them. Uh, and not worry, not worry so much about are they driving the robot car, are they driving the lap car, are they driving the open car. They feel comfortable with your uh, caregivers. And uh, then there are the U factors, such as your general health, your performance status. Performance status and general health kind of go together. It's, it's more about how functional are you, how active are you. These things are going to play largely into your recovery uh, because we're going to need you or you, by virtue of being here, realize that, we're ne that you were needed to um, walk a lot. I mean, you probably, your surgeon was probably driving you nuts asking you how many times you walk. Um, your nutritional status, your exercise tolerance, and later on we'll get into hopefulness. But uh, exercise tolerance is one that plays in um, more commonly here in North Carolina. I did my fellowship at UCLA and I, I like to claim that, and I was telling folks at the table today that I, I rarely operated on somebody less than, more than 220 pounds in LA. And in North Carolina, I operate on lots of folks that are over 220 pounds. And, and um, oftentimes, your prehabilitation, if you have an opportunity to prehab, affects your recovery after surgery. So if you can learn to develop some exercise tolerance, walking a couple miles a day, every day, um, anecdotally, we know that those patients, we feel that those patients do better. There are the tumor factors, and Dr. Smith spoke about this. Not every two centimeter mass is the same. You could have a two centimeter mass in a 90 year old that may or may not have a lot of comorbidities, but they're 90 and they won. They won the game of life, quite honestly. And that two centimeter mass was generally more than 90% of the time found by accident and isn't hurting them. But I know that I could. And so maybe we don't need to risk it um, by intervening, and that's where active surveillance comes in. And again, that's a shared decision. And you have the two centimeter exophytic mass in the 45 year old, and you have to balance what's the risk of me or any treatment versus the risk of that tumor over time. And largely for 45 year olds, we're gonna wanna intervene because there's a long surveillance period associated with it if you don't. And, um, and oftentimes when you treat a small renal mass in a 45-year-old patient, they do extremely well, and that's the end of that conversation. You could have a two-centimeter mass that's endophytic, meaning entirely within the kidney or largely within the kidney, that's in uh, the only kidney that the patient has, and, they have a, and they're 45 years old. In that case, you're going to be wanting to make every effort you can to preserve the function of that kidney while removing the tumor. That's, again, different from the two-centimeter entirely within the kidney, but a non-functional kidney in a patient that has two kidneys that's 45 years old, that operation is different than, than this one. This is a partial nephrectomy, almost mandatorily. Uh, this is likely a radical nephrectomy that's probably uh, most certainly less complicated than this. That patient will oftentimes have a lower likelihood of complications and maybe even recover faster. Oftentimes this patient's going home the next day. You could have a 20 centimeter mass, a foot long, in a 45 year old and that operation's completely different from any of these other ones that we've talked about and that recovery is going to be different. And you could have the patient that has the thrombus that's entering the big, the big veins in their body and maybe tracking all the way up to their heart. Even more complexity. So different operations yield different recovery processes. You don't need to go to medical school to see that there's something here that probably isn't supposed to be there. And then here you have this small renal mass. So the treatment for these two tumors is going to be largely different, uh, and the recovery is going to be um, congruent congruently different. Some of it has to do with incisions. And again, this is where I get back to getting the driver, you know, working with the driver and not the car. Maybe it's appropriate if you need a par robotic partial nephrectomy. I say that I did a fellowship in surgical oncology, not a fellowship in knife. If we need three one centimeter incisions to take your tumor out, we're going to do that. If we need one two foot incision to take the tumor out, that's what we're going to do. 
So yes, robotic partial nephrectomies are preferred for small renal masses when appropriate and when, when feasible. And uh, recovery is definitely different than if you have a large incision. You could do a pure lap nephrectomy where we make small incisions. When we're trying to remove the entire kidney and we extract the tumor generally from a, a fan and steel or low abdominal incision. You could have a hand-assisted lap nephrectomy where you have a couple small incisions and then one to get the tumor out up here where you also place your hand to help assist you in, uh, in the dissection process. Maybe the tumor is larger or, um, or maybe the patient has had a lot of intraperitoneal surgeries or maybe the patient has had dialysis and this is a non-functional kidney that has a tumor in it and once you've had dialysis or a lot of um, operations in the past, you're inside your belly uh, within the sac that contains your intestines, there is a lot of scar tissue and perhaps you want to stay out of that. So you perform a radical nephrectomy through an incision. And then you could have a big tumor like we were talking about before where we're going to make an incision all the way essentially from your um, armpit across to the midline and all the way down to your pubic bone and, and it ends up being like a uh, Pillsbury dough can where you pop the thing and it goes and that's what we do to you. But that was what was required. So then what's the typical recovery? Typical. Everyone's different. It may be five days for me, it may be three days for someone else. For a robotic partial nephrectomy, a lot of times, the majority of the time, the patient's in the hospital for one to three days. We tell them light duty for two to three weeks, resume regular duty probably at about four weeks. And I, I use this terminology, forget. When do you start to forget? And the reason I say that is because you could be sitting there having, having, having forgotten that four weeks ago you had surgery, but you turn to pick up this glass, and all of a sudden you're reminded because um, and, and you're still healing and you pull on your belly and, and you know, you feel it. So um, for open partial nephrectomies, which are generally for the more complicated partial nephrectomies, uh, the patient's in the hospital for about two to four days. We tell them to stay on light duty at about four to six weeks. After six weeks, we, before six weeks, we ask them not to lift anything more than 10 pounds. And after six weeks, we tell them they could swing a golf club or do whatever it is that they were trying to do before. Another thing that I tell them is that uh, God or whoever it is that you're believing in is, is going to tell you what you can and can't do. If it hurts, don't do it. And eventually, that should hopefully go away. And you tend to start forgetting at about three months. For a pure lap, laparoscopic nephrectomy, where we're just... We're going to put the small ports in. We're going to remove the kidney. Um, usually, you're just in the hospital overnight. You resume light duty in two to three weeks, and you resume regular duty at about four weeks. A hand-assisted laparoscopic nephrectomy is about the same, just a little longer. Um, a big open nephrectomy depends. Depends on what, what happened and what was required. You spend up to a week in the hospital, four to six weeks before returning to work three to four months before you forget. It can be more depending on what was involved in the operation. So all of that we tell patients, and we've been telling patients that for 100 years. Not that we've been doing all of these operations for 100 years, but just that, I mean, this whole six-week thing, no lifting greater than 10 pounds for six weeks, we've been saying because the person that taught us told us to say that, and the person that taught them told them to say that, and 100 years, you can go back 115 years. And that's what we've been saying. Um, and that doesn't really matter as much as one factor that's impossible to measure. It's amazing how hopefulness is disproportionately important when it comes to recovery. Patients that I could put the biggest operation down on people, and, and the majority of what I do is kidney cancer. The, do these huge operations in patients, and they oftentimes will be very hopeful, hopefully because of what things like Dr. Harrison and I have talked to them about, but um, they do well. 
no idea why that is. We call it the placebo effect in a lot of, a lot of things that we do, um, but it's, it's really hopefulness. And the belief that you're going to do well, those patients do well. The patients that think that they're not going to do well or are overly pessimistic, dark, that I'm trying to get out of the darkness before we go into surgery, um, and I'm not talking about that day, I'm talking about days and weeks before time, beforehand, something's going to go wrong. So hopefulness, there's this intangible quality of hopefulness that we can't, um, we can't describe, we can't measure, and all we can do is try to inject in, in the conversations that we have with, with patients. And we've all, that treat kidney cancer, we've all seen the patients that um, should have done not so great, that have just flown, and, uh, and years and years and years and years later. We've seen all the home runs that we've had, and, um, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with uh, reasons that we can't explain um, yet. Uh, but maybe we'll never be able to explain them. Maybe that's the part that the, the patient brings uh, by virtue of their personality and their support system and uh, the experiences that they've had in their lives, maybe the faith that they have. So I think that's an important part of recovery that we don't talk about a lot. And the reason we don't talk about it is because there isn't a survey for it and there isn't a, a lab for it. Um, if you have any other questions, questions about anything. Uh, I heard a couple people talking about their uh, conditions and, and, uh, and where they stand in their disease process. And uh, if you ever have any questions and you just want you know, some off-the-cuff uh, advice or conversation, you can uh, always get in touch with me. That's it. Thank you very much for that really thoughtful discussion of how we um, uh, recover from this. And um, uh, I think that's um, a nice segue. We're going to go back toward um, medical oncology again. Uh, the transition point is, uh, at least at UNC and I think a lot of different places, the nurse navigators who help you navigate. When do you call the surgeon? When do you call the oncologist? When do you call the radiation oncologist? How do you do this? What do you do? Who do you know to ask questions? This is who you call. So, <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, I'm Sarah Kohlmeyer. I'm one of three nurse navigators um, with UNC's urologic oncology program. I'm also an oncology certified nurse practitioner. Um, so, you know, nurse navigators really um, help navigate help navigate your journey, um, help you get through where you're trying to go. Um, we help make sure our team provides the best communication. We help you communicate with your providers and with your team. Um, I kind of like to think that we help connect the dots between everybody. Um, generally, nurse navigators are really experienced nurses. They've been nurses for a long time. Um, they generally have a high degree. Um, UNC's Cancer Hospital navigators are all certified in oncology. So, um, the, A little bit of history on navigators. In the eight, 1980s, I think there was some kind of recognition of the need to help orchestrate a patient's um, cancer journey. And in the 2000s, we started to make it a standard of care. So how is your nurse navigator multidisciplinary, which is something that is a big focus at UNC, is making sure we have a good multidisciplinary team. Um, your navigators are going to help guide you through initial talking about initial testing, treatments, appointments, diagnosis, and helping to educate you along the way and answer any questions that you might have. Um, your nurse navigator is going to help you be your advocate and your liaison. Be, about uh, providing support, identifying support, and making sure that you get in touch with the right support to um, help any need you may have. Um, we do serve as educators as well about everything along your journey. So we're going to educate you about your diagnosis. We're going to educate you about your treatment options. And we might even help provide education when treatment is needing to be changed. 
Um, this kind of is a really cool picture I found um, about how the Navigator kind of brings everybody together. Um, so you can see here, so you've got nurses, pharmacy, uh, nutrition, genetics, rehab, survivorship, um, psychosocial issues, and then here it kind of cut off a little bit, but you have your oncologists, your surgeons, your radiation doctors, and your pharma pharmaceutical folks. So the navigator is really kind of in the middle here, and we're your, your orchestrator to make sure that you can reach all these people whenever you need to, and that we can help get you to the right spot. Um, so the, your nurse navigator is really kind of your direct link um, between the patient, yourselves, your survivors, and your team. Um, we're probably the easiest people to get a hold of on your team and can make sure to um, get you in touch with the person you're trying to reach, um, especially when it comes to the urology clinic at UNC. Um, so yeah, generally, um, most nurse navigator programs, your navigator is kind of your one person to contact for all your needs whether it's a nursing question or changing an appointment um, or a question about a treatment or an upcoming a visit that you might have. So, um, Nurse navigators are also gonna be um, meeting with you through your journey, talking to you about um, different issues you might be having and help to really break down the barriers in care that you're coming across because that barrier might be different for every patient. Um, you might have a financial barrier, you might have a transportation barrier, or you might have um, just, you know, need some, some support. Um, nurse navigators are really great about knowing where the local resources are. So we're going to definitely make sure that we get you into the right, the right programs and the right groups that you need. Um, like I said, kind of bringing down those barriers, whether it's transportation, financial. Um, we do a lot of, um, at UNC, getting people lodging. So we know that our patients are traveling from really far away, um, so we help to find them places to stay while they're coming for their visits. Um, and connecting you to providers outside of UNC, too. We work a lot with Duke. Um, we work a lot with other, um, other facilities. You know, our patients are coming from really far away, and so we might work as a team with some of their local doctors. Having a navigator um, is a really great person where those outside people can call us and we can um, help facilitate anything that's needed. Um, so education, I know, um, you know, Deanna is one of our navigators who's here with us too. You know, with UNC Urology, we're really trying to bring education into our navigator program and making sure that we educate our patients about anything um, that they need along the way. So from initial diagnosis of, of their um, malignancy to um, their treatment or to even just nutrition, exercise programs, things like that. Um, so local resource education and support. Yeah, we're gonna try to get you to the right people in the right spot. Um, so the urology team at UNC, um, my name is Sarah, Deanna's here, Melissa Holt can be with us today. We're all certified in oncology, about a little more than 20 years experience between the three of us providing nursing care for you guys. So thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. You make it seem really, really easy, but it's, it's not. So um, our next talk is Dr. Mike Harrison. Um, we're now in the last couple of talks really going to look at the future. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the new drugs and second line therapy, but um, really where the new stuff is is some stuff in imaging, which um, Mike over at uh, Duke has been doing a lot with in the last several years. And then after that, we'll be talking about immunotherapy. So. Here you go. Are you, you need to load up your yeah, phone, right? Yeah. Here. Password protector.
not it's under KCA. It's in the KCA. But it's oh, right there. And then pet and RCC. So thanks, Kim, for having me here and the organizers. Um, so I'm going to talk over the next probably 20 minutes or hopefully less about PET, which I know there's a lot of excitement about. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is PET, and I'm, I'm going to try not to get too technical. But I think, you know, again, there are a lot of misconceptions about what is PET and what it can do, how it works, things like that. So I do you know, want to just mention a little bit of science behind it. Um, I will talk about what could pet, pet tell us, so what are kind of, what's the promise of pet, and then I'll give a few examples and kind of review the evidence, hopefully pretty concisely. So um, this is a nice slide showing kind of the evolution of technology over the past, over 40 years, and you can see from left to right in terms of CT and, and pet both, um, the resolution has gotten a lot better over the years, and then it's only really the last maybe 10 or 15 years where it's gotten to the point where we can start to be able to use it uh, for different purposes. So what are the potential advantages of PET-CT over just, say, CT alone or other imaging? And I think the advantages are really that it marries both structure and function. So structure is in terms of the CT having a very high spatial resolution, being able to look at different uh, types of tissues, bone, fat, air, other things like that. And then the PET, on top of that adds the function. So we can characterize lesions, you know, how are they, say, taking up sugar or doing other types of things, depending on what kind of tracer you're using. And then that may allow you to better detect uh, lesions or at least to maybe better separate out, separate out which lesions are lesions to be worried about and which lesions are lesions you should not be worried about. So this is a nice slide kind of showing that marriage. So on the top, uh, row, you have a PET scan, and it's black and white, you'll notice. You have a CT in the middle row, um, and these are different views, kind of a frontal view, a side view, and then a, the last column is a patient lying on his or her back uh, with their belly button pointing towards the ceiling. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, the PET-CT marriage, you know, so you first take the, they first take the PET scan, um, and they colorize it. Um, and then they overlay the, uh, the CT on top, and that gives a lot more information than just one or another alone. And then they can kind of play with the different features uh, back and forth. Um, so, um, so, so on the topic of PET being kind of a functional type of an imaging, um, what, what types of things are unique to cancer? What, how, how does cancer function different from normal cells? And so this is a, this is a classic slide. Um, first published by Hanahan and Weinberg in 2000, I believe, that's now been updated in 2011. And these are showing some, some kind of cardinal features of cancer or hallmarks of cancer biology. Um, so these are things like deregulating dereg cellular energetics. So, so that means cancer takes up glucose more than normal tissues, um, things like evading growth suppressors, um, you know, other things inducing angiogenesis, which we all know is very important. In, uh, in kidney cancer, and then sustaining proliferative signaling, and of course avoiding immune destruction, which is being increasingly recognized now as important in kidney cancer. So uh, since, since I think especially FDG PET is so misconstrued, I do want to just talk about a few basic, uh, basic principles. Um, and so to do that, I'll have to talk about a little science. But also to note, when most people say PET, they don't, they don't say FDG PET, they don't say floating, sodium fluoride PET or some other kind of PET. They just say PET, and usually what they mean is FDG PET, which is basically looking at sugar and how the tumor takes up sugar. And so this is a kind of a cartoon that has a lot of science in it, um, but basically you can break this down very simply. Um, what it amounts to is what you're looking at is a cell membrane, so, so of a, say a cancer cell. There are glucose transporters in that cell membrane. So sugar flows from a, a gradient you know, into the cell. Um, 
And what's unique to cancer cells is the cancer cell is relatively inefficient. So it doesn't go towards that bottom pathway that's in the mitochondrion. Um, it just kind of cycles back and forth. And so in doing so, it takes up a lot of sugar relative to normal cells. And we could take advantage of that with FDG PET imaging. Um, so this is a slide showing FDG, so kind of a, a sugar-like substance flowing through the same sugar transporter that, that sugar would. Um, and normally sugar, uh, these, these arrows here, uh, see if I can point them out. These arrows here are showing different kind of enzymes that convert the sugar into all different types of things. Um, but the cell can't get rid of the FDG, so it can't flow back out. It also can't flow down into other pathways. So that FDG is then trapped, and we can take advantage of that to do imaging. And so what we see is this, uh, the, this FDG that's trapped in cells. Um, but this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because you can imagine if a patient has one or several tumors in their body, what are you really looking at? Are you looking at all of the tumors? How do you, how do you kind of quantify that? Um, and so what is commonly used is an SUV max, it's called. And that's, uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry to have to, to mention these kind of technical terms, but that is one voxel. And a voxel is like a pixel. So a pixel is, is two-dimensional. It's a square. A voxel is three-dimensional. It's a cube. And so it's the cube in the tumor that has the brightest intensity. So what you're doing then is you're boiling this whole tumor down to one little point that's the very brightest spot. Um, and that's the most common measurement called SUV max. There are other ways of of looking at this. Um, so, so one of my colleagues at Wisconsin likes to say images are just more than one number. In fact, they're very complex. The data that comes out of these PET scans is just enormous. And so one of the reasons why we use SUV Max is it's very nice. You have one point that you boil everything down to. But the disadvantage of that is you don't really capture all of the features of this, this lesion. So think about this lesion. You know, It may have spots that are brighter than others. It may have um, different nests of cells that are behaving differently. You know, some are good, some are bad for other uh, lack of a better way to kind of explain it. So there have been other ways of kind of quantifying and describing what you get when you get a PET scan. So one of those is SUV peak, where you actually take some diameter around the, the brightest voxel, so the SUV max, so like one centimeter around, and you quantify that. You can also quantify the whole thing in terms of the total uh, brightness, say, uh, and you can do measurements. So this is a list you know, of just all kinds of possibilities, just showing that SUV max is, is what is commonly used. And if your oncologist or, or other doctor were to get a PET scan, chances are what would be in the report is an SUV max. It would say this is, this is something that looks like a tumor here, and this is its SUV max. It's you know, seven or, or whatever it is. Um, for now, these other measurements are being looked at for research purposes, but aren't really, aren't really a standard of care. But as, as bioinformatics gets better and things like that, I think that the field of, of pet research may move to looking at some of these other, other things because they may be more important and may not, uh, you know, I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, may better describe the tumor burden in the patient's body than just boiling each tumor down to one little point. So, so if you look up in, in NCCN guidelines or you look in, in different uh, guidelines and recommendations, Medic Medicare's recommendations, for example, uh, they do not routinely mention the use of PET scans in kidney cancer. And so these are some of the reasons why. Uh, most PET tracers, including FDG, are eliminated by the kidneys. So you have, you know, what you can see is the FDG kind of flowing down the tract. Um, from the kidney into the bladder and so on and so forth out the body. Um, also, early investigations seem to indicate that primary kidney tumors, so tumors within the kidney, had relatively low sugar uptake, so it didn't seem to be kind of useful there. So FDG PET didn't really seem to add a lot to just conventional CT imaging, for example, for looking at renal masses. But when they kept looking at it, it looked like FDG PET performed a little bit better for detection of distant metastases, so it was fairly uh, specific, meaning that if it was a if it was a positive FDG PET, you could kind of believe that that result. So, uh, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what FDG PET could tell us, and I'm going to argue a lot of this is is still a, a work in progress, but I think there's a lot of hope um, 
as the, as the technology advances and maybe new tracers are, are used, um, we could have some, some real use from PET. So the first area where I think uh, PET may be useful is better characterization of small renal masses. Um, so basically differentiating malign malignant from benign small renal masses. And I, I, I'm sorry, I missed Dr. Smith's talk. Did she talk about, about gerontuximab? Or? No. Okay. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about what's you know, maybe the most promising tracer gerontuximab. Um, the second area where I think uh, PET can maybe tell us something useful is we know that there are patients at high risk of recurrence, and we know that because of different features when Dr. Rampersad takes them to surgery when he looks in the pathology, may make them more likely to recur. So if they're T3, T4, if, you know, if they have other high grade, you know, those kinds of things. We think those patients are, are probably more likely to recur, but we can't see the disease on our conventional imaging. So maybe we could see that better on PET. And then the key is, if we see it, hopefully we can also treat it and, and have good tools that, uh, to treat it to, to improve outcomes for patients. And so I think it's important to note both of those things have to be true. Um, and then the third thing, which is something that's near and dear to my heart, is in patients with metastatic kidney cancer, can we improve prognostication um, or prediction? So prognosticating how long patients may live, which is important for a lot of, a lot of things, um, but also predicting when therapies might work or, or even just treatment monitoring, are, are treatments working or not? Um, current prognostication systems, as I imagine was discussed this morning, rely really on clinical factors. So things like laboratory values, the patient's performance status, um, but maybe PET should be in there. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of the data around that. The other problem is that standard radiographic methods, so CT, are a little bit problematic in kidney cancer. Um, without getting into it too much, there are um, some situations where we see that the tumor is growing on CT scans. And so conventional research methods of measuring the tumors might say, this patient is progressing, when in fact the tumors are changing in their characteristics of taking up um, different, uh, different IV contrasts, and we think, no, maybe they're dying in the middle or, or something like that. Um, and there are other, there are other scenarios where we, can't, where we can't really evaluate patients. So for example, a patient who has tumors only in the bone, tumors in the bone are very hard to measure and hard to kind of quantify. So maybe that's a situation where PET could be useful over CT or say, say bone scan. So without further ado, I'll get into the first um, one of these, which is characterization of small renal masses. And this is, I think, one of the most exciting um, uses of PET. So this is uh, gerontuximab, so CG250, uh, which is labeled with iodine. Um, so this is a monoclonal antibody, so an antibody that recognizes what's called carbonic anhydrase 9 on the cell membrane of specifically clear cell kidney cancer. So Keeping in mind there are other histologies or types or flavors of kidney cancer. It's you know, specific for clear cell kidney cancers. And so keep in mind that in terms of indeterminate renal masses, if you think about it, about half are clear cell renal cancer, but then the other half are made up of some with limited malignant potential, so things that we would worry less about, papillary and chromophobe, histologic types, but also benign tumors, oncocytoma. So there is a concern for overtreatment of small renal masses specifically, some renal masses that are greater than, or sorry, less than or equal to four centimeters. So we know that patients who have, uh, you know, especially uh, full nephrectomy or even partial nephrectomy are at risk for chronic kidney disease and then uh, for cardiovascular disease. So maybe we can differentiate um, amongst these different categories of indeterminate renal masses with something like gerontuximab. And so again, I don't want to, I don't want to bore you with too much biology, but this is, I think, a nice cartoon just showing one of the pathways that's really central in kidney cancers, and that's uh, the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor gene. So what you can see on the left here is that in conditions where there's normal oxygen levels in the tissue, the VHL, von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor, basically marks this thing called the HIF1 alpha, hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha, for degradation and it's degraded. Now in clear cell kidney cancer, what happens is in a large majority of cases that VHL is inactivated for some reason, maybe a mutation. Um, as a consequence, it doesn't inactivate that HIF1 alpha. That goes to the nucleus of the cell 
and sets off this whole signaling cascade where there's growth factor uh, overexpression of a lot of different things, VEGF, which I imagine you all are familiar with, but also carbonic anhydrase 9. So this is something that's kind of specific for kidney cancer based on the biology of kidney cancer, and specifically clear cell kidney cancer, the most common type. So um, this was an important trial that came out relatively recently where they were looking at this, this uh, compound, so gerontuximab, the antibody again against CA9. Um, took about 200 patients with complete data, uh, sites all over the US, and these were patients who were going to go to surgery for renal mass. And what they did is in these patients, they did a PET CT with gerontuximab, and then they also did a contrast enhanced CT. And so what they were asking is, is the PET CT better than the regular CT? And their standard of truth then, it was surgery. So in these trials, it's always important. You have to have some kind of gold standard. You're trying to, you're trying to say gerontuximab PET is better. Well, what's the, what's the gold standard that you're looking against? Um, so the sensitivity and specificity for clear cell kidney cancer was pretty good, 86%. So these mean um, kind of the confidence you can get for ruling in or out the diagnosis of, of clear cell kidney cancer, um, positive and negative predictive value. Um, so again, different ways of kind of looking at that were, were fairly good. The criticisms were, though, that these patients were actually not just patients with small renal masses, which is you know, what I think this could be used most for. Um, only 52%, so only about 100 of those had pretty small renal masses. 20% um, had really large renal masses where they would have just got a nephrectomy as standard of care. Um, other things that are important to note, and this is the case for a lot of PET compounds, so I just, I just mentioned this here. Um, all PET compounds are not the same. They have different features. They have different half-lives as far as how long they last in the body. They have different uh, technical specifications, so a scanner may be optimized for the most common type, FDG, but it may not do very well with, uh, with this gerontuximab. So there's really a trial needed in patients with small renal masses to kind of sort this out, and patients who are going to go, um, not just patients who are, who are uh, candidates for surgery. So I, I do want to show you a few pictures, because I think this is pretty neat. So this is, this is a sample image, so um, thinking about what's the standard of truth or the gold standard, um, the patient had a one centimeter mass. It was clear cell kidney cancer on surgery. Um, and this is what it looked like on non-contrast CT. This is what it looked like on the gerontuximab PET. So it was, it was positive. This is what it looked like um, on a fusion. So in this case, uh, both the contrast enhanced CT uh, and the PET fusion would have picked this patient's, uh, this patient's kidney cancer up. Now contrast this with this scenario. So this is a patient with a 1.8 centimeter oncocytoma, so, so meaning a benign type of a tumor in the kidney uh, at nephrectomy. So, and my arrows, I realize, uh, have moved here. <laughs> but um, you see the mass there in, in the kidney seen on, on a contrast enhanced CT. Um, and it would have been worrisome. It was positive, so, so worrisome based on contrast enhanced CT. But on the PET CT, it did not uh, uptake the gerontuximab. So this may have, in this case, may have saved the patient from surgery. Now, in this case, of course, the patient did get surgery as the standard of truth, but in, in clinical care, this is a scenario where, where the gerontuximab might have been helpful. So scenario two, so what about surveilling patients who are high risk? Um, I'm not going to go through the evidence because I think that it, a lot of it's retrospective and not, a lot of it's not that great, but I'll just sum it up by saying that a lot of different guidelines, whether you want to look at the NCCN, um, the American Urologic Association, the European Uro Urologic Association, basically say that the, the role of PET for follow-up of RCC remains to be determined. And I think the main concern is, is false positives. So if, if you do a PET scan, you know, maybe it picks up some lung nodules that weren't otherwise seen, but maybe it makes you more worried about lung nodules that are nothing in the first place. Um, and, and that's the real concern, I think, there. So I'm going to move right into the, uh, the third kind of area where I think PET may be useful. And this is looking at response to therapy, so specifically tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So drugs like Sutent, drugs like Serafinib. Um, 
And so uh, these aren't meant to be read, but just to show you, there are at least seven trials that were summarized in a, in a nice review that came out earlier this year. And what's key about these trials is each one of them had relatively few patients. The largest number of patients had, the largest uh, trial that is, had 44 patients, and they ranged down to having 10 patients. Um, and, and if you look, uh, most of the drugs studied either Suten or Serafinib, sometimes a combination. Um, they had different timing. Uh, most of them were looking after one cycle of Suten, so that usually about six weeks. But others looked at, at different time points. Um, and they did use mostly SUV max, but some used, uh, some used some other features as well. So they were, in other words, these were a little bit heterogeneous, small trials, different designs. So sometimes in, when that's the case, it's hard to draw firm conclusions. Um, so I'm just going to show you the, the very largest trial and, and just kind of talk about the top line results. So this was the one with 44 patients. These were previously untreated patients who had metastatic clear cell kidney cancer treated with Suten. And what they did is they did this FDG PET imaging at baseline. They did an early time point at four weeks, and they did a late time at 16 weeks. And what they were really hoping to see is that uh, responses at either four weeks, so a, ch a change from baseline at four weeks or a change at from baseline at 16 weeks would correlate with either overall survival or with progression-free survival. Um, and interestingly, uh, the response at four weeks did not correlate with any outcomes. But on the other hand, progression at 16 weeks did predict an inferior survival. Um, they also find a, f a finding that's been found in other trials, which is that a high SUV max at baseline, so a lot of uh, lighting up bright um, very intensely and number of pet positive lesions predicted for inferior survival. So um, I'm going to try to show you some more pictures because I think this, this makes it more interesting. So what you see here is a patient uh, who kind of falls into that camp. So a patient who at baseline had lesions, and you can see the little arrowheads uh, pointing out some different lesions. The patient had a response after four weeks of therapy, and then after 16 weeks of therapy had new lesions indicating progression. And then this is just picking out one lesion on a cross-sectional imaging show it how, showing how it decreased in uptake from baseline to four weeks. Um, this slide isn't, isn't necessarily meant to be read, but just showing you kind of the, the differences and, and things that were shown in, in the different trials. Um, so in some trials, early assessment of response by FDG PET uh, could predict both progression-free survival and overall survival, whereas in that largest trial, it couldn't. Um, in one trial, trial, high baseline FDG PET uptake, so, so being really bright at baseline, seemed to indicate the disease was more aggressive. And then the last one is, is Dr. Rathmel and colleagues' trial. So this was looking at patients, interestingly, prior to, to kidney surgery or, or removing the primary tumor. And they did show that lower baseline uptake uh, were more likely to respond to serafinib, which was an interesting finding. That was in patients with clear cell kidney cancer, not in the non-clear cell subtypes. So um, in the next slide, one of the last slides, I'm just going to look toward the future. And, and I, we can make a list of you know, tens of hundreds of different pet tracers that have been looked at in cancer. Um, but these are a couple that I picked out that I think are interesting, just because they may or may not be specific to, to kidney cancer. Um, so one, if you remember back to that hallmarks of cancer diagram, one thing that may be unique to kidney cancer is this tumor hypoxia effect. And so they've looked at this compound um, that's usually abbreviated F-MISO or something else because it's unpronounceable. Um, and they showed that PFS, but not overall survival, was shorter in those who had more hypoxia, meaning low oxygen levels in the tumor, versus those who had higher oxygen levels. Uh, this is another uh, type of PET, so looking at, again, if you remember back to that hallmarks of cancer diagram, looking at tumor proliferation. And this is the group that I worked with at the University of Wisconsin, looking at basically a labeled thymidine, so, so a compound that's used in DNA synthesis. When cells are proliferating, they're needing a lot of this compound as kind of the raw materials, um, and so they're turning over a lot of this. Um, and so what, what we showed in this study is that we could characterize or quantify changes during SU10 exposure and during withdrawal. And so if you keep in mind, SU10 is given on a 4-2 schedule. So it's given for four weeks on, two weeks off. Um, 
we showed that VEGF is associated with that flare. And in an exploratory analysis, patients who had less clinical benefit appeared to have a large withdrawal flare. And so I'll show you a, a little picture of that. Um, so this, hopefully, you're able to see. But versus baseline, this patient had a decrease in intensity in this particular lesion. Um, from here to here, the patient had their planned two-week holiday of Sutent, which is in the, you know, the FDA-approved uh, uh, package. Um, and the patient had a large withdrawal flare. This patient did not do as well as patients who had less of a flare. So just indicating that this may be a tool to, to sort out or tease out biology and, and see how each tumor is acting. Um, so in conclusion, I, I would say that PET is very promising. I think um, though there's a lot, of be, a lot of work to be done. Gerontuximab, I think, it, it is important and may eventually play a role in management of small renal masses. FTG PET-CT, though, uh, really isn't a standard for surveillance after nephrectomy. Um, it may be, in the future, may be useful for evaluating response to targeted therapy, so drugs like Sutan, Phenator, so on and so forth. But I think we're still a long way from qualifying it as an actual biomarker uh, for response. And you know, lastly, I'd say there's lots of more room for research, new tracers, some of which I showed you, and new methods um, to, uh, to make things better for our patients and, and better help with management decisions. So thanks for your attention, and uh, happy to take any questions. Um, so our last talk is Dr. Sergius Moskos, who's an oncologist at the University of North Carolina. Um, his specialty is immunotherapy, and I can't tell you how many uh, questions I've had already today about immunotherapy. So that's why we saved it to last, so you all had to stay all the way to the end of the conference. Um, and so thank you. tell us what's new. Uh, thank you, Kim, for inviting me to give a talk about immunotherapy. Uh, my role within the University of North Carolina is actually melanoma specialty. Uh, so you would ask yourselves why a melanoma doctor is trying to give a talk in renal cell. And the answer is uh, supposedly we are seeing, the melanoma docs are seeing us, melanoma doctors are seeing us uh, doctors from the future for what is going on in the field of renal cell cancer, which lacks approximately one to two years in development. Uh, in relation to what is going on with um, with uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma, does anybody dare to say what this looks like, patients-wise, not uh, not doctors? <laughs> so I, I tried to find a picture in the internet about uh, how a cancer cell looks like and how lymphocytes look like. So I want the patients to understand. There is a size difference between what's a cancer cell, which is usually a big thing, and how these tiny little things are trying to go against the, the cancer cell and kill it. So we have a size difference. And sometimes number of cells, of immune cells, and uh, function matters. Okay. So the top point is that um, since it's Christmas, I'm going to give you a couple of books for recommendations, books for Christmas. Uh, uh, it's, I'm going to try as simple as I can with respect to describing what is a normal immune system functioning because a lot of lessons from the normal immune system functioning, you will answer yourselves about what are these drugs that are coming out in the renal cell carcinoma mean and how do they work. So an important aspect of what is immune surveillance and immune editing, So, uh, and then uh, what are the mechanisms of cancer immunity and suppression, just to explain the variety of different mechanisms that exist and why uh, immunotherapies is not one size fits all. Uh, I will also would like this audience to remind the high dose bolus IL-2. It is no longer a sexy drug as this has been out for 20 years, but nevertheless should not be overlooked uh, as uh, progress goes by. And then uh, the future for now, is immune checkpoint inhibitors, and that's what we're going to talk in the end. And uh, and then the question is whether the future is for for everyone. So these are the books for Christmas. Uh, the left uh, side book I read it when I was a resident 14, 15 years ago. Uh, it is written very uh, almost 15 years ago. So there's not going to be any excitement about the recent advances of immunotherapy, but it's going to give you a very nice 
history of immunology and immunotherapies in cancer. Uh, you will see all this drama that has happened over the last 100 years about questions like that the scientist had, does the immune system work or does not have it all? So we had a lot of ups and downs throughout the 120 years as to whether the immune system plays a role. So there's a nice, nice book here, pretty big, like 300, 350 pages. Not an easy book to read, but uh, I would therefore recommend. And the other one is uh, the one I'm trying to finish when I'm going back and forth to work through an audio book. This is a generic history of cancer book. Uh, does not talk about a lot of immunotherapy, but again, you're going to see how doctors and researchers are by all means human beings and they're having their own biases and how progresses are being made. Uh, um, so the purpose is not to explain you how a normal immune system works, but show you that basically we don't talk about immune system in general. We talk about two different arms of the immune system. The one that is less relevant for cancer, less relevant for cancer, and the one that is more relevant for cancer. So this is the adaptive immune system. Uh, the our immune system needs to remember what a cancer cell is because it's a non-self. So it's not something non-specific. And the key to all this, um, the key is the interaction of these cells that are called adagen presenting cells. These are the cells that pick up stuff that is non -fo that is non foreign from the from the environment. This can be viruses. This can be bacteria. But yes, it can be cancer cells because cancer cells are non self cells. So these are sampled from the microenvironment and are being presented in these antigen presenting cells. And it is this key interaction with these other cells that are called lymphocytes that you saw in the very first slide that uh, is the key to educating the immune system, okay? So that's a different uh, way of seeing the adaptive immune system, fancy picture where antigens are being uh, picked up at these antigen presenting cells. These are called dendritic cells from the Greek word dendros, which means a tree. So they have these spi spiny projections. And it's again an uninstructed, naive T cell that is gonna come and encounter the antigen presenting cell and then it's gonna get activated. And either it's gonna kill the cells or some of them are gonna be left behind for memory. So that's a very simplistic uh, approach of what is adaptive immunity. And again, the key interaction here is the interaction between the antigen presenting cell and the lymphocytes. So here's your first kind of complex slide, but the way I'm gonna present it is, is like, it's basically the interaction between the antigen presenting cell that I showed you before and, and a lymphocyte, a T cell, is actually so complex that over the last 20 years there have been so many molecules that have been uh, identified to play a role in this interaction. And it's no longer a simple interaction of a signal that means that this antigen presenting cell is gonna present the antigen and oh, the immune cell is gonna get activated. The decision, so it's no longer one what's called first signal. It is a number of other things that the interaction between these two cells have to be taken into account. And whatever is in red, it means that these are actually proteins that are gonna say, no, I'm not gonna get activated. And then those things that are uh, green, these are the cells that are say, yes, I'm gonna be activated. So the net effect of whether a, an immune cell is gonna actually get activated is the net result of the positive and the negative factors. And it's easy to understand that this looks to me like a complex car with multiple brakes and gas pedals. So that's how complex nature is. And, all of, and uh, right away, you're beginning to see things that you may have seen already on the internet. You're seeing things like CTLA-4. So there's already a drug against CTLA-4. It has been used for renal cell cancer. It's called Yervo. It has not been approved yet. Uh, also, you see these other uh, negative uh, immune checkpoint protein that's called PD-1 or PDC one that, that is the target for nivolumab uh, or uh, pebrolizumab, pebrolizumab that was FDA approved for melanoma three months ago. And then whatever you can see in red it means that there are already drugs in development. So it is no longer just the PD-1 that you see or the CTLA-4. There are a bunch of actually targets that are currently in clinical development. So this is a very hot area of interest. So there's gonna be more to come over the next five to seven years. Um, okay, so uh, this is the gas pleather scenario in normal states. So if you have two 
gas pedal is in one brake, then it's a go. And that's a nice looking car that actually makes a turn and does not go upside down. And this usually happens when there is an early stages of an infection. Our immune system has to become activated. Uh, very simplistic the way present, but this is a, way, a good way to understand how it goes. And then when the immune system takes care of business in the normal states, then all these, uh, several of these negative immune checkpoint proteins are being upregulated, and then basically you have your car nicely parked, uh, ready to be used for something else. Uh, so I want people to understand here that cancer and the immune system, there is constantly an interaction. I remember I was a third year medical student in Greece when our pathologist said, our body makes approximately 30,000 cancer cells per day. And the only reason that we don't develop cancer is because we have a constantly working immune system. So, so there is always this tendency, the Darwinian tendency of our bodies to, be, to develop mutations, to become something different, to evolve over time. But there is constantly this system that's called immune system that is trying to seal things off. So therefore, any conditions can turn a normal tissue into a cancerous tissue, and by definition, the cancerous tissue is slightly different from the normal tissue, and that is perceived as foreign, as a non-self by the immune system, and in so doing, the immune system is trying to eradicate those cancer clones. And then there is this constant uh, interaction between how a cancer becomes genetically unstable, develops new mutations, okay, becomes more different, and how it actually tries to suppress the immune system and how this battle between the immune system and, and, and cancer is going on and on. And that has been, and that probably has been going on for years and years to come. This is not an overnight event. And eventually cancers develop because the immune system has failed. So when somebody has cancer, it's basically a failed immune system. So there's not some, anything to fix it. It's not like if you increase your exercise or you increase your activity or you improve your diet or you get a supplement, it's gonna get better. It is already broken and therefore there have to be ways to restore in the way of drugs. I believe in alternative medicine, but um, the effects of it are very well unknown uh, in a patient with metastatic cancer. So, so, Again, will the future be one size fits all? I just talked to you about one way that the immune system is suppressed, and that is by upregulating these brakes. But there are a number of things that are going on. There are many different ways that a family can become dysfunctional. And I, I quote one of the very nice phrases that uh, Alexander uh, Tolstoy has wrote in Anna Karenina. There's one way that a family can be functional. People would be happy and, you know, you know, kids love their parents and vice versa and everybody's happy. But there are many ways that a family can become dysfunctional. That is how cancer is. There are many different ways that your immune system can become suppressed. So here we go. So if the cancer cell does not upregulate these HLA molecules, the ones that require for the first signal, the immune system is not going to see it. And therefore, that's how cancer cells evade the immune system. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to produce all these molecules that basically suppress not only those cells that are supposed to pick up these antigens and instruct those lymphocytes, but suppress pretty much everything, suppress the antigen presenting cells, but suppress the uh, immune uh, cells as well. And guess what? Many of these things that are being secreted by the cancer, or when the lymphocytes come in contact with the cancer, it can be a toxic effect. So. As this nice review article from Teresa Whiteside, who was my neighbor in uh, neighbor office in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, she says immune cells in the tumor microenvironment are functionally impaired, and I'm and I'm adding and are killed. So your lymphocytes are getting killed by the cancer uh, by the by the cancer cells, and you all are patients and you understand how to read a complete blood count uh, test. But what I want to emphasize you here is I'm going to show you, I'm showing you eight different patients, CBCs, simple as that. The common with these patients is that all of them have metastatic cancer. And the one thing that makes a big, big uh, interest is that the fact that all of these uh, lymphocytes are low. So there is a fundamental pro problem in most of patients uh, met end stage cancer that their lymphocytes are low in the blood. Okay. 
So for people who know, who don't know what is a high dose bolus IL-2, it has been FDA approved therapy for 20 years. It's not for everybody. It is uh, a very uh, toxic therapy. Not everybody can do it. It is being given in uh, hospitalizations. Uh, this is called a hospitalization is called the cycle. Two cycles include a course, and we can evaluate things with, between uh, every every two courses. Okay, so uh, so this is what IL-2 does. So this is our very first patient that was treated uh, at uh, the University of North Carolina with renal cell cancer. So what you can see here is that before he got into the treatment, his lymphocytes were low. And then when he started to get IL-2, his, his lymphocytes disappeared. And that's what IL-2 does. Makes the lymphocytes disappear from the blood and they're going to different parts of the body, including the cancer cells, and they're supposed to eradicate the tumor. And what happens is when uh, the cycle ends, then the patient shows up right before the, uh, the next uh, dose and his lymphocytes are almost double right before the second course. So what I want to emphasize, again, do not forget drugs, are, uh, drugs like IL-2. So IL-2 is otherwise called T-cell growth factor. I call it the T-cell steroid. If patients in way of immune suppression is actually they just don't make a lot of immune cells, IL-2 could be a very good drug to give. So the same thing now, but now I have this thing there, which means that the cancer cell can actually immunosuppress because it can also uh, develop properties of antigen presenting function. And then all, all, all of a sudden you see that the, you know, the, can, the, the, the lymphocyte can take instructions, wrong instructions from the cancer cell. As you can see, there are more breaks that the cancer cell can induce as opposed to, uh, to uh, gas pedals. And this is now the scenarios when somebody has cancer, okay? So you may have advanced cancer and your first signal is uh, functioning and you have two brakes in one gas pedal and therefore you're looking like a Formula One car that is on high brakes. But uh, if, for example, your immune system uh, it, the cancer does not have ex expressing those things that makes the cancer cell visible, then you're like a car that is driving in the middle of the night without knowing where things are. And you can have the third situation of immunosuppression where things are functional, but the cells are dying because the cancer is suppressing them. And this is a car on fire. So what the immune checkpoint inhibitors in renal cell cancer, uh, and that seems to happen in 50% of patients with uh, renal cell carcinoma is that you may actually be able with one of these drugs to eradicate one of the two gas pedals and that could be sufficient for uh, uh, the immune system to get activated. And sometimes if you use two of them at the same time, okay, and uh, this is the PD-1 plus uh, the uh, ipilimumab, then the this immune system is really revved up to the point of going up in the air. So um, this is uh, a most updated list of clinical trials using these immune checkpoint inhibitors in various cancers. And I want to show you the renal cell cancer in relation to other cancers. So what I want to show you is that if you use these two drugs, the epilimumab and the nivolumab in various doses, okay, uh, in combination, you can rev up the immune system to such an extent that you can see response rates of as, as high as 44, okay? Um, now, if you use only nivolumab uh, in renal cell cancer, then the responses are less, but nevertheless, much better for responses that you get in other cancers like lung cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, um, so, what I, want to, uh, what I want to emphasize is that different cancers would respond to these drugs in different percentages, and um, it seems that the renal cell cancer behaves in terms of response rate similar to melanoma. So again, see where the epilimum and involvement was given in patients with lung cancer, the response rate was only 16%. So what are the benefits and challenges of these new glass of immunotherapies? So definitely, uh, the way we see that in melanoma, when 
epilimumab one was approved in 2010, we were able to give immunotherapies in a much larger uh, number of patients. We were giving epilimumab in a 90-year-old. We were giving epilimumab in a 70-year-old with congestive heart failure. We were giving epilimumab in somebody with coronary artery disease. IL-2 cannot be given in those patients. So the, the, the application of immunotherapies will be much larger in a larger group of people, the same way we saw that in melanoma. What else would be convenient? It's going to be an outpatient therapy. You don't have to be admitted for this horrible five-day course of high-dose bolus IL-2. And in fact, if you come to the MICU, the Medicine Intensive Care Unit at UNC, you're not even going to have a bathroom. So uh, uh, it is definitely less toxic, okay? So that's, that's no questions asked. But again, we have to see the less toxicity um, in a different uh, perspective. The benefit of IL-2 is that you will do it for two months or four months or six months, and then you're going to be done. With these kinds of immune checkpoint therapies, potentially the side effects can be longer lasting, in particular if you use the combination of EPLI-1 and Evolumab. Will they be more effective? So we, in our mind, we have linked response rates that I just showed you with, uh, 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 with clinical benefit, which is progression-free or overall survival. The trials are too early right now to say whether this high response rate would actually lead to longer survival, but it's very safe to think this way. Uh, but unless we do follow these trials over a longer period of time, we will not be able to know the long-term benefit. And uh, the challenge is we're talking about drugs that are, it's $20,000 um, an infusion here. So we should do a better job, we as doctors, to really refine which patients actually are candidate for. And I think I predicted that this combination of drugs can be effective in up to 50% of patients, but definitely not 100% of patients. And for how long we're going to give these drugs? So right now, the drugs, uh, at least the approval of the pebrolizumab for melanoma is basically indefinite. So as long as you have cancer and you respond to that, then you're going to be getting pebrolizumab forever. Is that the right thing to do? I mean, this is, provides a huge burden to the, uh, to the insurance companies and the healthcare system. And again, as I said, does response rate correlate with long-term benefit and what's the cost? And how to combine these drugs with, with uh, uh, other drugs? And I intentionally did not do that because I would wait for you to make uh, your, uh, your questions in the uh, panel discussion. So my summary and conclusions is that future is for some, but definitely uh, more than the lucky IL-2 candidates. So you shouldn't be privileged uh, because most of you, you will be candidates for both of these drugs, the epilimumab, uh, uh, sorry, the pembrolizumab alone or in combination with uh, epilimumab. Um, but not one size fits all. That I, have, I, have, I think I showed you that there are many ways that cancer, i.e. the family can become dysfunctional, and this is one of them. And do not forget that there are also good old drugs, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors, can some of them, I've seen that they have response rates 20, 30, 40%, and people have been on that for years and years uh, to come. Uh, and there are also high dose bolus IL-2 that you should not forget. Um, but if, um, if the patient is not, um, uh, if, is in an advanced stage of disease, you just cannot beat up an, a dead horse uh, with any immunotherapy, in which case you have to use other types of treatments. So these treatments are not for everybody. So uh, I thank these six, seven patients and their families who have trusted us to give them high-dose bolus IL-2 in the hospital, and I'm sure that they are eager to see something less toxic than IL-2 and uh, the GG program that uh, refers patients to us for this. Thank you. Hi, 
thanks all the doctors. Um, thanks for your lecture. My father is 94 years old, uh, two and a half years before he found, um, occasionally found uh, a small uh, renal mass in the left kidney at 1.2 cm. Now it grows to the 2.5 cm. Uh, still in the so-called active um, surveillance. And during this time, he had a stroke, uh, recovered pre pretty good for the stroke, but after that, uh, he used some drugs to prevent the stroke and also majorly concerned the stroke again, so he used the Plyvex. Um, according to the um, insert, the one of the um, side effects that Plyvex, uh, it will cause the white cell can't reduce, is that may uh, potentially cause immuno problem for the kidney cancer, this is the first one. Secondly, um, one of the option it says it can do the partial um, uh, the uh, nef nephronectomy, but uh, uh, some doctors said because his age and also even without aspirin uh, prefix, it may cause difficult to recover. So the partial um, cut may be more difficult to recover than the total cut. Is that true or not? Thank you. Yeah, I think Dr. Ramfors, I will let you answer the question. I guess maybe I'll rephrase, and you can tell me if, if this is correct. Uh, you know, one, one question is how does Plavix affect um, decisions about going to surgery, and then um, also how do you decide when you're going to go to surgery or not when there's these other factors. Yeah. yeah. And the, the Plavix uh, cause uh, the Y cell count low oh. will affect the immune response to the existing cancer or not? Okay, we'll, we'll let Dr. Moskos take that one afterwards. Uh, oh. I would predict, I, I do not, I'm not very confident about the Plavix side effects and what types of white blood cells have been affected. Uh, if that affects the neutrophils, which probably would be the case, then these again are innate immunity cells that are not significantly playing a role in the overall cancer and recognition and everything. So if Plavix does affect non-lymphocytes, I would say that they would not affect response to immunotherapies. Yeah, and I, I would, I would I would think that we would, in that case, that in the patients with cardiovascular disease, we would see disproportionate percentage of patients with immune-modulated secondary malignancies. Um, so what was, can we go back to what, the, what those questions were? Um, one was the, how old is the patient? I'm sorry? It's a 94 years old. Um, two years before was no much complaint. Still no complaint about the mass in the, uh, Kidney, no urine, yeah. uh, blood, no nothing, but it had a stroke between uh -huh. um, the two years. Yeah. So uh, what you're describing is you're talking about a tumor that's incidentally diagnosed, right? That isn't doing anything to them. Not yet. Not yet. good, good, good verbiage. Not yet, but um, in a patient that has a significant comorbidities, including age. Not, not the least of which. Um, you really have to put things all together again, like I said before, and you, you determine what's more likely to hurt the patient. Is the treatment of the tumor more likely to hurt the patient, or is the tumor more likely to hurt the patient? In a situation like this, again, without having met your relative or, um, and knowing them and their functional status and their other medical history and not knowing whether or not their parents live to be 120 years old, or, you know, without knowing that, there are very few people that are going to encourage an in intervention at this time, um, considering that the likelihood of hurting that patient with an intervention is higher than the tumor hurting them. Thanks, Rob. And, and by the way, even with by size criteria, and, and though that's growing, let's say you're talking about a four centimeter sporadic tumor that is kidney cancer, let's just make so, those assumptions. The likelihood of, I mean, what you're worried about is you're worried about that spreading, right? So first of all, it's gonna 
it's it's growing reasonably slowly, and then the likely of that likelihood of that spreading is somewhere between one and three percent per year. So even that is still low, right? So. Do we have another question? I, I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Harrison a question, and and maybe the answer is nobody's looked, but. Um, uh, now that all the immunotherapies are coming around, has anybody looked at PET scans or novel imaging in, in uh, and, and maybe Dr. Moscos can comment too. Yeah, so he may be more uh, of an expert on that than me, but I know that people are interested in that, in uh, imaging PD-1. I don't know if it's so, possible. So, uh, you know, that falls into the uh, how to decrease the cost and find patients who uh, most likely respond to the therapy. So. Um, there are some promising uh, uh, tracers, so it, it's a little bit complicated. So I, I told you that there is a number of mechanisms of immunosuppression, one of which uh, has to do with the enzyme it's called indolamine deoxygenase. Uh, it is an enzyme that basically metabolizes an amino acid uh, that's called tryptophan. So there are some tracers that we are actually interested at UNC to, to, to use uh, that actually called the C11 AMT, which is an analog of tryptophan, that uh, we hope that patients who have immunosuppression, they would have high levels of uh, the uh, uh, tryptophan analog. And we would plan to design a trial where we would image them before treatment and then give the uh, PD-1 and see whether we can correlate activity of the tracer with um, with, uh, with um, a response to therapy. Uh, but nevertheless, the community yet, I think, and again, that's, that's my, my, my bias, the communities, there are so many of these that we have to, to, there are so many options, and right now there has not been a commitment towards one, but it seems that the AMT is more likely to move forward, I think. So I a question back here. So, Many cancer therapies are partly immune suppressive, and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, of course, they have off-target effects that could be partially immune suppressive as well. So if you put that in the context of the immunotherapy approaches where you treat with blocking the PD-1 pathway, and you get responses in about half the patients on, on a good day, like you said. Is there a correlation between the response rate to the initial therapy, the specific tyrosine kinase panels and, and target affiliations, with the response to the PD-1? Could you use that as a predictor? Uh, there, you're asking me? I'm asking anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I can, I can take that. Um, so again, with the caveat that I'm not an immunologist, I know that you know, different companies are developing PD-1 inhibitors and PD-L1 inhibitors, and they each seem to have their own assay for looking at PD-1 positivity. So, you know, in, in the trials, um, PD-1 positivity doesn't perfectly predict response, and then also patients that are PD-1 you know, or PD-L1 negative also seem to respond. So I think, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a lot of nuances as whether they're looking at tumor cells or other cells, and what they're using is the cutoff. And I was told there was, I believe it was AACR, there's a whole session about this at, at some recent meeting about just how kind of messed up that the whole assays are, for, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, Can you repeat the question? Was that the question <laughs> or not? <laughs> but my question is, you've got two competing influences. You've got the anti-tumor immune response, and that's what you'd like to get. You also have direct anti-tumor effect by a compound or a drug. So if you treat with a compound that is going to target the cancer cell, for many of those treatments, you're also going to be targeting the immune response. So if the immune response is playing an important role in eliminating the tumor cell, you're actually working against yourself often. But that's going to depend very much on the target profile of an individual candidate drug. So I guess my question is, when you list these 10 or so various targeted therapies that are being used in renal cell carcinoma, they're all going to have different kinases that they hit. They're all going to have different effects. So do those effects have a predictive value towards the response to anti-PD-1? So the effects of the kinases, the therapy? If you have a patient that doesn't respond to a particular tyrosine kinase inhibitor, is there partic <laughs> are there kinase inhibitors that uh, don't work, but then that would then predict a response to PD-1 because 
they don't work, and part of, the re part of the reason they don't work is because they didn't block the immune response, and the immune response was playing an important role to control the tumor. So now you get rid of the break, now the immune response is, instead of suppressed, is enhanced. So, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a kidney cancer specialist. I can tell you that these paradigms of combining uh, kinase inhibitors with immunotherapies have been done in melanoma and are ongoing in melanoma because we know that you may actually want to have uh, benefit from both, uh, from both uh, uh, worlds, so like a direct and that humor effect that would actually may lessen the immunosuppression or whatever is going on, and then coming up sequentially with an immunotherapy. Uh, there has not been any clear signal yet because these trials are ongoing. Nevertheless, the combination of these drugs is very kind of toxic if you give them concurrently. Like there's a lot of hepatotoxicity. I'm aware of a trial where Sutton was given in combination with <coughs> nivolumab. It was very toxic. But I have not heard of whether a response to a tyrosine kinase inhibitor would actually um, correlate with a response to a PD-1. <coughs> Thank you. OK, any last questions? Oh, one more? Sorry, um, as um, my father's uh, um, the candidate for the potential uh, um, active uh, watching, uh, we're always concerned, do we need to do biopsy to make sure that's cancer or not? Um, as I understand, for all the medical therapy, always required pathology uh, level um, diagnosis. But the surgery, maybe not, because anyway you can get the tumor, and then you can do that. Is that true or not? Yeah, so um, one, of, one of the, the common statements by surgeons is that if you're going to take it out, that was your biopsy, right? Um, the fact of the matter is in your father. Even if you were to know what that was, you're very likely not going to want to do anything about it, considering every the whole Weltanschauung, the whole view of things. Um, and uh, biopsying it would just, it might give you some more information, but it's not going to affect really what you're going to ultimately do right now. Um, so there is, it's not as though biopsy is completely without risk. So why put somebody at risk? if you're not going to act on the information that you're going to obtain. So, so yeah. So uh, in a typical patient like you described, typical, right, never met your dad, typically, we wouldn't encourage, or I wouldn't encourage biopsy simply because it's not really going to change, at least my opinion, but then again, patient, it's a shared decision Good. <laughs> most, most older patients do. Uh, you know, th those that have one, right? And, and we're talking about an 80 plus year old. They've won the game of life largely, and that's easy for a 40 year old to say, but when, maybe when I'm 78, I'm going to be thinking, you're just, you know, you, you haven't finished. But um, 94 year olds will commonly say, why are we doing anything? Could I take you? Uh, Yeah. And so, so I think. Yeah. So you kind of read my mind. I was going to ask Ed to play devil's advocate. What if gerontuximab scans were approved? Would you do that <laughs> to maybe reassure this gentleman, yeah. or so, would uh, it, you know, maybe add more anxiety if it was positive? You know? Yeah. G two fifty from the land of UCLA. Um, we, uh, you know, in, in this particular incident in case, even if I knew, they, so you said it's two and a half centimeters. Uh, no. uh, yeah. Yeah. So on the basis of size, historical patholo pathologic studies, on the basis of size, there's an 80%, slightly above that, 80% chance that it's kidney cancer. We know that. Knowing it isn't going to really change what you 
might want to do. Um, does that make sense? Whereas, whereas if, if you were if you were uh, in a in a better total health situation, um, and you were trying to determine whether or not the risk of treatment were worth the intervention, then maybe that would be appropriate. Or I would feel that. Right. I, I think this question kind of sums up the day. Like we have a lot of new therapies, we have a lot of new advances, a lot of new things to do, but ultimately it comes down to every decision seems like it's very personal, right? Um, from the decision to do surgery, to how to manage the drugs, to how to choose which drugs and how, how to do all this is um, ultimately um, uh, very personal. So I, I hope that we've been able to give you a little bit more sense of what's out there and what goes into some of these decisions, you know, what it is we think about and talk about when we're trying to um, help guide you through uh, this whole process. Um, so with that, it is three o'clock. I want to thank our speakers. <laughs> who come and, and, and shared their day with us voluntarily uh, to try to help uh, clarify this, but also to thank you all for coming, for being a very interactive group, and for you know taking a really active role and interest in uh, 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 this disease, kidney cancer. Um, I would encourage you to um, uh, follow up with the Kidney Cancer Association. The, these, uh, if you want to watch any of these again, they'll all be online, um, I would guess, probably by Monday. Um, the Kidney Cancer Association puts these uh, meetings together um, uh, around the year, about quarterly, and um, let us know if there are topics that you want to hear about. Um, there are way too many topics to cover today. We tried to pick what seemed kind of relevant, new, and, and fresh, and burning. But um, if there are good topics you want to hear, let Mike know, let me know, let the people at the KCA know. And um, next time we do this, we'll um, cover those topics as well. And we're here all the time. And safe travels. Thank you.